missionaries in Barbados, uh, uh, their home for the press got comforts. We thank God for them. Pastor Tory Williams, let's welcome him. <laughs>
it would have been a dead giveaway. And she would have never been able to accomplish what God had planned for her. It was in India that Amy understood the incredible truth of what her mother had told her many, many years earlier as a young girl. That God had given her brown eyes for a reason. Listen, when God does things, He does them for a reason. I want to preach a sermon about God who sees in advance, a sermon out entitled Jehovah Jireh. Genesis 22, verse 1, very familiar text. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there is a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and split the wood for the burnt offering, and rolled and went to the place in which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar so off, and Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there in the place placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood, and Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven to Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the lad, nor do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes, and looked there, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket, by its horns, so Abraham went, took the ram, and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of the son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said today, the name of the Lord, it shall be provided. Let's pray. Hallelujah. God, we come this morning by the blood of Jesus. I thank you for all that you are and all that you do. I pray, God, give us clarity. Today, God, speak to us. Uh, May we leave this place today knowing you more. God, if there are any unsaved, save them as only you can do. God, I thank you for the every opportunity and privilege to minister your word as we give you glory this morning. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's consider firstly with you knowing God. As a missionary, one of the things that I had to settle in my spirit and belief was that I serve a God who can do anything. And a God who is a living God, in other words, who is not dead. What I'm saying is what Pastor Campbell just said. I didn't need theological facts. It wasn't going to be sufficient for uh, uh, me to know some things about God. And I knew that crossing international threshold, my dependence as a husband, my dependence as a father, taking his four uh, kids and his wife to a foreign land, a land we had never set foot on before, a land we didn't know not one person there. We didn't have any knowledge of Barbados. And so this wasn't just some experiment or, shall I say, even what we do. But my prayer was, God, I need you to manifest yourself in my life and in our circumstances like never before. My heart's cry was, God, we need you. And so I'm praying that one day as I was just talking to God, this was after we had been announced to go, God spoke to me very clearly. He said, Tori, you don't need to know anything about Barbados. You don't need to know anyone in Barbados. All you need to concern yourself with is knowing me and knowing that I have called you to Barbados. Now that sounds like, oh, you know, oh, oh just know me. But listen, knowing God isn't as simple as it sounds. The truth is, everybody thinks they know God. One of the things that uh, you learn about Barbados, it is highly religious. It is a British colony, or was, and it is deeply rooted in the Anglican Church. And so it, uh, there's 11 parishes, what you and I would call cities, in Barbados. 
And each of those parishes has an Anglican church. It is the parish church. It is the Anglican church. People use those churches for reference points. But what is interesting is all of the schools in Barbados are set on a property where the Anglican church is. And so I'm saying that to say to go to school is to go to church. They're intertwined. You learn math, you learn religion. And the average Barbadian is very, very intelligent as far as education. And so what that produces is a lot of people who know about God, but they don't know God. They have God in their head, but God hasn't made it into their hearts. Matthew 7, 22, Jesus said these words, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many, many wonders in your name. And then he says, I am going to say to them, I never knew you. Listen, church, you and I must know God. John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, he says, that they may know you. The Apostle Paul, when speaking of Christ in Philippians 1, 3, 13, he says, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. And so now fast forward with me for a few months. So we're in Barbados now. We're having church. And we're seeing God move in people's lives. And one day, as I'm sitting on my porch, I'm reading Genesis 12 about God telling, you know, uh, Abraham uh, uh, to leave his country, leave his father's house, to go to a foreign land. And the Bible says, if you know the story, that Abraham took his wife Sarah, he took his nephew Lot, all of their possessions, they took all of their furniture, all of their, you know, books and school clothes and favorite snacks, and they put it on a container. That's not exactly what it says. That's how I was reading it, because that's what we were doing. And so I'm just reading all of that, and then I get to verse 8, and I come across this statement. Verse 8, and he moved from there to the mountain east of Beth, who pitched his tent with Beth on the west and Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord. And call on the name of the Lord. Now I know this may simply mean that Abraham prayed to God, but I also believe that there is significance in this statement. He called on the name of the Lord. How many know names mean something? Particularly when it comes to the Bible. The Lord's Prayer says that when you and I pray, we ought to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so again, that phrase just kind of jumped out at me that Abraham called on the name of the Lord. And as I'm pondering this phrase, God reminded me of the word he had given to me before we ever left. Tori, just know me. Okay, God, how am I going to know you? By my name. So out of that, I just begin to start studying the names of God. You know God has a name. In fact, he has lots of names. And the names of God are important because it is how God reveals himself in Scripture. Every name reveals another aspect or piece of God. Every name is a revelation of him. In other words, when you read one name, God is saying, I'm like this, or I'm like this. But then you read another name, and God is saying, oh, I'm also like this. For instance, he is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. We have flags around this building. Flags mean something. That's why people get upset when people won't stand at the singing of our national anthem. Because our flag, our banner, means something. It means things are worthy of honor. His name is revealed to the children of Israel in Exodus 17, 15, when they faced the Amalekites. You know the story, Aaron and Hur had to hold up the arms of Moses uh, and ultimately the children of Israel ended up defeating the Amalekites. Uh, but it wasn't with overwhelming force. It wasn't with an experienced army. Uh, at this point, they were just a transient bunch of tribesmen uh, who had just recently escaped sl uh, uh, slavery in Egypt. Uh, they should have never defeated the Amalekites. Uh, but the Bible says that the very presence of God went before them as a fire by night and a cloud by day. And so they realized, listen, we could have only made it, we could have only been protected because Jehovah Nisi, our flag, our banner, went before us. He is Jehovah Shalom, the peace of God. 
that means that in the midst of a storm, or dare I say a pandemic, God can still give you peace. He is Jehovah Shabbat, the Lord of hosts. This is his fighting name. Some of you are familiar with the boxer years ago by the name of Smoking Joe Frazier. Now, if you saw his birth certificate, it did not say Smoking Joe. But that was his fighting name because he believed that when he hit people, it was like fire in his fist. Well, God has a fighting name. He is Jehovah Shabbat, the Lord of hosts. He is Jehovah's kingdom, the Lord, our righteousness. It is not my righteousness. You know, there's two kinds of righteousness. One of them won't work, and one of them will. All of our righteousness, he says, is as filthy rags. Paul said in Romans 10, 2 and 3, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they be ignorant of the righteousness of God, and seeking to establish their own, they do not submit to God's righteousness. It's like you're trying to pay off your debts with monopoly money. Listen to me, I know you've heard it before, but I'll say it again. You can never be good enough. You think you're going to get to heaven because of how good you are? You can never be good enough. Never. But you can be righteous. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. He is Jehovah Roha, the Lord is my shepherd, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals us. And so all of these names serve their own purpose in revealing who God is, but no one name, as I said, is a full revelation of him because that is impossible. Let's look secondly, though, at Jehovah Jireh. Because in our text, Abraham uses this name. You know the story Abraham and Isaac are headed to the land of Moriah. And all of a sudden, Abraham is confronted with a question by his son. Isaac says to him, well, we seem, you know, Dad, to have everything uh, for the fire. But we are missing one essential ingredient. We don't have a lamb. And Abraham responds by basically or essentially introducing the doctrine of providence. He says, listen, son, God will provide a lamb or Jehovah Jireh. God's providential care will take care of us. Now, as I was studying that, uh, this word provide, it reveals something to me about God that I had never truly understood, at least not the way I do now. Provide comes from two words, pro video. It means to see before. So, because it really means to look out for ahead of time. The Greek word that is used for providence is the word pronoia, which means to think before or to take thought of before. And so providence so means God is taking thought of and looking out for ahead of time. And so you get in a tough situation and God is saying, well, I've already thought of that. And by the way, I've made provision for it. Provision, that vision again, he sees before. And so in our text, what Abraham was saying to Isaac, son, God has already seen before and made provision. Hebrews tells us that Abraham believed that God was actually going to kill Isaac or allow him to, but he believed that God was well able to raise his son up. But Abraham understood something about God that each and every one of us must understand here this morning. Now, you serve a God who sees your situation before it happens. For me said before, your tomorrows are his yesterdays. God is not reacting to things. God is proactive. He is in control. Listen, when I realized what uh, Abraham was saying to Isaac, this gave me great understanding, but not only that, it filled me with incredible confidence. I began to understand that although me and my family arrived in Barbados last year, January 27th, I understood that God, Jehovah Jireh, had already arrived in Barbados way before we did. If he was indeed Jehovah Jireh, 
then it meant that God had preceded us. He had gone before us and already prepared not just the way, but the people before him. Now again, I understand this is a theological truth, but again, theology alone won't do much good when all your reference points and all your bearings are out of place and upside down. Personally, I needed more than knowledge. I needed a revelation. And as I started pondering all that took place in our short time in Barbados, it began to blow my mind. Many of you may not know this, but a week before we were supposed to leave, we didn't even know where we were going to stay. We had no place to stay. Our bags were packed. The tickets were purchased. We, had no, we didn't even know where we were going to stay short term. Not a hotel, not an Airbnb. We were still looking. My wife asked me to tour I'm like, I, I don't know yet. And that week before, Gene Parker came to this church. I don't even know. He came to the service. We went out to breakfast here, Frank Cooper and I. And he said, Stork, where are you going? Bahamas? Bermuda? He said, no, Barbados. He said, Barbados? I get that order. He said, man, I don't know what somebody told me. He said, do you know my brother is married to a lady from Barbados? She's a doctor. She said, her family has a has homes there, has a compound there. Like, for he said, they always invite us, say it's always an open invitation, you can come whenever you want. He said, I've never taken them up on. He said, but you want to call my brother. Cooper realized, he remembers, I went outside from the breakfast, I called his brother right there. He said, he put me in touch with his wife. Long story short, for sake of time, when we got there, listen, this place is a compound. It's, they got, they live in a six bedroom, they got one bedroom, they got four bedrooms, all behind two gates, not one gate, two gates. <laughs> it's three minutes from the beach. You can walk to the beach in three minutes. God knew, he knows my wife. So, <laughs> I learned to swim there, but that's a whole other story. <laughs>
knock on the door. My wife goes out and gets it. It's a lady named Gina. She's in our church now, but she comes, she heard us taking her around with our instruments and our singing. We had never really met her. We had seen her. She lives on the property. And she said, Are you guys having church Sunday? And my wife said, Yeah. <laughs> so that Sunday, her, we have three names. All of them came to that service beneath the mango trees right in our yard. That was the beginning of our church, and two of them were still faithful. One was just an older lady who she's already, she's a pastor's wife, she, their church was locked down. And so she came, and I'm telling you that God said, listen, I will build my church. <laughs> last thing, last December, many of you are aware, my wife got very sick. We went to church Sunday, everything was normal. After service, she said, Tori, I'm really not feeling well. I don't know what it is. And so we went home, we thought we didn't sleep at all. And she comes and wins. And she said, Tori, I, I got to go to the emergency. I got to go to the doctor. We got to do this. Because my wife, her pain threshold, if you know, is very high. She, and so I knew right away something must be wrong. Long story short, because we had to go to one hospital, then we went to the or went to the ER, then they sent us to the hospital. That hospital, if you've ever been to a third world hospital, Paul, get ready for the picture. But if you've ever been to a third world hospital, you can already put it up. I mean, people are lying on the floors. They're in the hallways. A guy is bleeding from his head with gals around his head for over 20 hours. We stayed in that emergency room for over 36 hours sitting in a chair. It is, it is, it is not sanitary. It, I don't know why he got that mask on, because it ain't sanitary. <laughs> but we went into that emergency room. And we're like, God, you got to help us. And we look up. Months earlier, when we first walked down with that lady on our property, she said, can you have your, your kids write a little card? I know some people at the hospital, the nurses and the doctors, they would love to get some encouragement. So we said, sure, our kids, they wrote some letters. She took them to the hospital. When we walked into that emergency room, we said a little blue sheet of paper. Stacey and I looked up and said, I think that's the one our kid. Yeah, that's the one TJ wrote. That's TJ. And as we're wrestling with where are, what is going on, God said, don't you hurt your child? I showed up at this emergency room before you did. I have everything taken care of. Listen, the doctor we got, we should have never got. People were calling, oh, what, what's your doctor? I know if you. When we told him, we said, oh, I don't know how you got him, but you're in good hands. And he was, I mean, he was an exceptional doctor. Her surgery, she said, one of the best, I mean, just seamless. Listen, church, I could go on and on and on. Wow. I can show you so many situations in less than a year of us being there in the Bayless where Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees before, the God who acts in advance or prior to has shown himself. Why is this important? Because when you venture out for God, listen, I thank God for a church who supports my family and I as missionaries. Anastasia and I knew if we ever had a need, I could call pastor or church would meet it. Could you imagine if every pastor didn't know Jehovah Jireh? Could you imagine if they only knew Jehovah Jireh? If they thought it was you who was supposed to anticipate every need and meet every need, there's no way this church could sustain every missionary. Chandler does not have unlimited resources. Oh, we serve a God who does. That's right. Oh, Come on. You can count on the faithful agent, Jehovah Jireh. Thank God for Tim. I know you've allowed him to use you to meet the needs of world evangelism. But I want to tell you, there are needs that can't be met by a bank deposit. We have to come to realize that every missionary does, every church does. We have to realize that us they'll be blowing up the mother church with need after need, request after request, when they ought to be for Jehovah. Jehovah. 
Listen, people can be the need, but people cannot be your provider. Why? Because people cannot go before you. People don't know your future. But, but listen, this is not just a personal revelation. When you begin to read the word of God, you discover that uh, uh, this is one melodic scene after another. Uh, and once you hear the melody of what I'm preaching, uh, you will hear it over and over and over again. You will find yourself saying, oh, that is Jehovah Jireh right there. You will find yourself in situations and you'll be, oh, that is Jehovah Jireh right there. And that's so great. The angel of the Lord says to Philip, he speaks to Philip. Philip is redirected from his ministry in order that he might be at the right place at the right time. Presumably, you know, he's a, a little bit reluctant, I would think. Why do I have to go down this road? Why do I have to go there? I'm a very effective evangelist right here. But he decides, well, I'm going to go ahead. Guided and directed by God. And when he gets there, he finds a man. A man reading Isaiah. And the man's asking, how do I know what I'm reading? I don't know what this means. I wish there was a person to tell me what this means. There's Philip to tell him what it means. I was thinking about Mordecai, our wicked Haman plotted against him. One day he had him set up to be killed the following morning. But the night before it was supposed to happen, the king, King Ahasuerus, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 6, that night he couldn't sleep. And so he decides to read a book, not just any book, but a big boring book, the Chronicles. And he not only read the book, but he read the part in the book where Mordecai had earlier saved his life, and it resulted in the whole resolution of the problem. Think of the woman at the well. She just happened. She just happened to come out to the well when the one person in all the world could give her living water was sitting by that well. And she wondered. Why did she just happen to go right then? Maybe she had planned to go earlier, but she couldn't find her cell phone. <laughs> the Bible says when she got there, Jesus was already there. He saw her coming before she ever decided to leave her house. And he got there in advance. Jeremiah 1 5, one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible. All 66 books, I know that's a big statement, but it's part. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Jeremiah existed in the mind of God before Jeremiah ever became a human being, and so did you. See, we're familiar with this verse, sometimes too familiar, but I want you to stop and think of what God is really saying about a God who acts in advance. Do you know how many events had to take place for your parents to come together and have <laughs> Meditate. Not just a day until I say in high school. Do you know how way, way back you can go back to Adam and Eve to think about how many events had to come to place for you to be who you are? Arthur Jerry Bridges in his book titled, I Will Follow You, O God, he says this, the doctrine of providence is not like the doctrine of the Trinity to be received by faith because he says, experience gives a demonstrable stamp of evidence, even in all the minutia of circumstances, which form the parts and pieces of God's divine plan. In other words, he's saying, listen, listen, you got to experience this. He means that we ought to expect in that in everyday events, in the everyday events of our lives, we will find ourselves saying in Proverbs 16, 9, a man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. Daniel 2, 21, the New Living Translation says, he controls the course of world events. He removes kings, and he sets up other kings. This verse ought to give you and I great hope. Either God is enthroned over all the political, military, social, economic forces of the entire world, or he isn't. Okay. Ephesians 1.11 tells us God is operating according to his own purpose to work out everything 
according to the counsel of his will. God has a counsel. He has a plan. He has a purpose in history. And he's working everything right down to the smallest of, of so-called chance events or the corruption of man. You know, I hear people say, if this law passes, it's over. Really? And I know some people who survived 400 years of slavery. Oh. Yeah. Or if this guy gets in office, we're done. Okay, maybe that's true. No, no. <laughs> but seriously, if God can save his people from Pharaoh, the most wicked man on the planet, the most powerfully wicked man, listen, Christianity is not going anywhere. The gates of hell shall not prevail. <laughs> One of the things that makes God God is that he alone declares the end from the beginning. Isaiah 49 through 10. Remember the prior things from long ago. I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Who tells the end at the beginning. Who tells the end at the beginning. From ancient times, things not yet done. My plan will stand. All that I decide, I will do. It says God remembers from ancient times. Things that haven't even happened yet. In other words, when God starts thinking way, way, way back, he's thinking of future events. When God starts jogging his memory and going way, way back in his memory, he's thinking of things that you and I haven't even experienced. They haven't happened yet. He says, from ancient times, I remember things not yet done. Oh, OMG. OMG. You know God never sends an OMG text? Because it's never caught by surprise. It would actually have to be OMM anyway. Oh my my. Oh my me. So I was putting this sermon together, it dawned on me that nothing ever dawns on God. God takes thoughts beforehand for every possibility, every contingency, for all events, for time and eternity. Job, even after all that he went through, he says in Job 23.10, he knows the way that I take. You know, I've learned to say, I do not know. But I do know that God knows. Oh, what do you think, Pastor? I don't know. But I do know God knows. that God knows. Yeah, that was the way Jesus dealt with his disciples. Of, why do you worry about this? And why do you worry? Don't you realize that your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things? Remember Corey Tim Boom, the story was told. How she asked her dad for a train ticket for a ticket she was going to ride to Amsterdam. It was three weeks away. He said, Yes, fine, Corey, I've got you covered. She kept going in day after day. Where's the ticket? Do you have the ticket? And eventually he said to her, Corey, listen. I told you I had the ticket. On the day that you travel, it will be there. Trust me, I'm your father. I do not know, but I do know that God knows. You know what stuck out to me in our text was how quickly and how sure and confident Abraham responded to Isaac's question back in verse 7 and 8. My son, my father said, Where, where's the lamb? Look. And Abraham said, son, God will provide a lamb. He didn't hesitate. He didn't say, you know, I'm not exactly sure if someone was going to. We'll just have to see when we get this done. God will. When I read it, I said, that's interesting because Abraham wasn't always that confident. Remember, I started back in Genesis 12. If you remember the whole situation with Hagar. Wasn't Jehovah and already in because Abraham said, oh, God, I got to fix this. If you remember uh, way back uh, with the, when we lied about Sarah being his sister, he wasn't trusting Jehovah Jireh in the move. I say that because the, the Abraham we meet in Genesis 22 is not the same Abraham we meet in Genesis 12. He had learned Jehovah Jireh by what he went through. He's looking back and saying, wait, that was God right there. Wait, he provided. He got me out of that. Uh, Abimelech could have killed me, but Jehovah Jireh showed up. Oh, we got this Ishmael. We could have never had Isaac, but Jehovah Jireh showed up.
showed up. And what he's saying to his son, son, I know you're young. I know you haven't been through it all yet, but God will provide. How do you know that? Because he's always provided. Let's close and talk about why, why God provides. Let's be honest. When we speak about provision, how often do we hear Jehovah Jireh regarding bigger bank accounts, bigger homes, better jobs? And those things have this, but Jehovah Jireh starts with the atonement of God that was rendered on behalf of his people. Yes, God provides financially. Yes, he will go before you and meet you in a foreign land. But all of those things are not the primary purpose of Jehovah Jireh. And so it's important that we do not lose context of, of our scripture here this morning. Abraham said to Isaac, my son, God will provide a lamb. Of all the names of God, this name Jehovah Jireh points us directly to the cross and the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on that cross. God is Jehovah. He's a God who sees before him. Primarily because God cares about people. And he sees to it that people get saved or have an opportunity to get saved. In other words, it's not until you look and see God through the eyes of redemption that you'll ever fully know Jehovah Jehovah. Revelation 13, he says, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. NLT says, Jesus was slaughtered before the world was made. That it means Jesus is not so afterthought. The ram that was caught in the thicket for Abraham, he was there before Abraham climbed that mountain. Listen, church, redemption is not an afterthought. The world literally hangs on the axis of redemption. That means everything you and I do, every sermon we preach, every ministry we get the privilege to serve in and be a part of, every time we witness, every offering, absolutely everything must be filtered through the eyes and the heart of redemption. If not, some will miss it. We'll veer into other things. We won't understand why this and why that, why I'm trouble processing setbacks and difficulties of the Christian life. We'll struggle to obey God, uh, but whatever he's calling us to do or to give, we'll delay, we'll put it off, we'll excuse, we'll justify. Listen, seeing things through the eyes of redemption is so, so critical. I was thinking about Joseph. See, if we're not looking through the eyes of redemption, we end up missing the entire Joseph story. You know, We'll look at Joseph and say, listen, when people mistreat you and do you wrong, listen, man, when they, they can throw you in piss, they can do all of that, you know what? But if you just keep your heart right and do it, God will raise you up. God will. Really? Because if I'm not mistaken, Joseph, yeah, he got raised up in Egypt. He was the second in command to Pharaoh. Is that what you pray for your children? Because I'm not. You pray, oh God, give them a great job. If you keep your heart right, Bill Gates has something for you. <laughs> That's not really what Joseph's story is about. Oh, that I understand. I preach, I get it. But Joseph's story is about redemption, folks. Exodus 1 5. Put it up for us. This is powerful. Just reading this stuff. That ain't it, I promise you. All those who were descendants of Jacob were seven descendants that came out of Egypt. But listen in parentheses. For Joseph was already in Egypt. See, the Bible says that there was a famine in Egypt. And if a famine would have come, it would have wiped out Judah. Judah would have wiped out the 12 tribes. They were about to die. It was a famine. I know we don't know, but it was a famine. Brothers are wondering what we're going to do. And I said, Joseph, I need to use you in that. It's just going to come family one day. And see, I've already said that uh, Jesus has to come through the line of the tribe of Judah. And Judah's already jacked up stuff with Tamar, so I can't believe it was Judah. <laughs> that COVID really comes in here about you, Joseph. But see, Joseph understood this. That's why when his brothers came, 
Jesus. And all of, listen, listen. Don't be mad at yourself. Yeah, if it was just about, he could have said, you know what? Don't be mad. You know, I'm good. I got a good job. I'm paid. Don't worry. It all worked out for me. Joseph said, he understood Jehovah Jeremiah because maybe Abraham, being his great grandfather, had told him about you. I don't got past him a lot. I don't know. But Joseph said, don't even worry about it. Because God sent me before you. Everything I went through, it was all about seeing people get saved. Man. This ain't got nothing to do with money or financial. Yeah, I'm blessed, but he didn't even mention that. No, I'm telling you what happened in Barbados, not because, oh, God's just mad at me. He's probably so faithful for us. That really had nothing to do with us. There's people in that church right now. God been thinking about them before they were born. And they're wondering, God, can this say, who knows? If I could tell you their stories. It's not cliche. These are real people. If I can really share with them, I can't make this stuff up. And I'm realizing as I'm there, as one lady came up to us and she said, I know this might sound selfish, but I believe God saved your whole family here, pulled your daughter out, did all these things, sent you $3,000 just for me. Come on, hallelujah. My wife said, and if that was all, we would do it again. Hallelujah. And what she didn't know is she wasn't the only one saying that. Another couple one time were sitting there and said their own version. Ian, 53 years old, he said, Tori, I know it's going to sound crazy, man, but I think God sent you guys all the way to our village. That's our God. Just for me. That's our God. Hallelujah. Come on. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. Clothes. There was a man named Nichols. I think his name was Brad Nichols. If you remember that. And this guy, Brad Nichols, I want to get this, the, the name right, but if you he, he was on the loose for raping four ladies, and he had um, now taken this girl. Her name's Ashley Smith. And she, he, she had taken, now taken this girl, this young lady, Ashley Smith, hostage. And he's in her apartment. He's got his gun to her. And this is a true story. And she's there, and she's realizing, listen, he's already, he's, it's in a joke. He's already raped and murdered four people. She's in there with the apartment. But see, Ashley Smith was Jehovah Jack. Because she ain't sitting there and said, what are you saying? She said, she said, I sat there and said, well, God must have brought him to my apartment for a reason. And she started witnessing to him. She was reading the purpose driven life. She read to him out of that book about where it says, lay down your life and serve others. By the time she finished, he's weeping. He hands her the gun. And he says, Will you come visit me when I'm in prison? She says, Absolutely. Turn yourself over to the authorities. But I was stuck. She said, You know what? I know it don't look good. I know I'm going through all kinds of things. But you're old enough. Nothing happens by the accident. We're not people who believe in luck and faith. We're not hoping on a plan. He goes before. He sees before. He thinks before. He acts in the What does that mean? That means whatever he's calling you to do. See, so many times we look through the rearview mirror. They're like, oh, yeah. And Abraham did it. He learned. If you're really going to know him, remember we talked about knowing him. you got to know him through your mission.
before we move to any other part of this service, listen, if you're not saved, can I first say something to you? Thank God you're in church. But you didn't come here on your own. This was a scheduled appointment. God has already scheduled this day for you long before. You come into this place, maybe you're backslidden. You think you did this all on your own? Well, I just I'm going to go to church. No, no, no. Because no man comes unless the Holy Spirit, God works both to will and to do. Just the desire you have to be here, God put that there, even if it's a smidgen. You're here this morning, you say, Pastor Williams, I'm not saved. I'm not right with God. Listen, a merciful, a loving God. Would he set a whole service up just for me? Yeah, he would. He would. Right. Absolutely. He would, he would have me pray months ago, orchestrate, just for you. Yes. You're here this morning, you say, I, I got to get right with God. I can't just leave here like I can. I can't ignore God. I can't keep pushing him off. I can't pretend. I'm just going to humble myself. I'm going to swallow my pride. And I'm going to let Jesus take the sin that he's already purchased. We're here this morning with heads about eyes closed. If that's you, if God's speaking to you, knocking at the door of your heart, I want you to do me one favor. Just lift up your hand. You say, pray for me, Pastor. Lift your hand all over this place. See that hand. See that hand. How many more? Quickly, just bless. See this hand. God bless you. Thank you for your honesty. How many more? Front to back, left to right. My eyes are closed. Hands are See that hand. God bless you. You join these others. Say it's me, man. This is where I'm at. I don't, I don't want to just keep playing games. Listen, we're living in a treacherous hour. Do not play with salvation. It's not a game, folks. You cross over and eternity starts. It's not a fear thing. Some people are more afraid of COVID than they are of God. It's a dangerous place to be. You're here this morning. You're, you're backslidden and you know it. You don't have to spell it. You know it. You lift your hand and you say, that's me. I'm coming back to Jesus. I see that hand. I'm tired of making excuses. I'm tired of looking at other people justifying. But what about this? I'm tired of looking at all the faults of the church and blaming this if they would. No, no, no. It's you. Ultimately, it's you. Last call. Anybody else you want to join these? I want to see that hand. You just slip it up. Say, pray for me. Pray. I need God. Pray for me. I see that hand. I see that How many more? Laugh. Lift it up. Just lift it up. Just a moment. I'm going to close this thing. God's waiting on you. Slip it up. He's waiting on you. Say, me? Yeah, you. Just put it right up. Right where you are. High where I can see it. I see that hand. God bless you. I see that hand. God bless your honesty. All of you, raise your hand. I want you to do it. Hold it back up. Lift it up one more time. Lift it up and hold it. High where I can see it. Don't be ashamed. Just hold it up for just a moment. Hold it up. You have your hand raised. I want you to lift your eye and look at me. Lift your eye and look at me. You sincere with God? I believe you are. You sincere with, you sincere with God? Over here to my left, back to the I want you all to stand. I want you to come. I'm going to pray with you. I told you I would, and I'm going to come through on that promise. I want you to come out of your seat. Come out of your seat quickly, quickly, quickly. Don't be embarrassed. Listen, Jesus died publicly on a cross. He died publicly. He went to a brutal Public death, shameful death. For you, for you. It's not just religion. It's not just theology. For you, for me. Our sin is that wicked. It's not. Our sin is not. You know, uh, it's wicked. His righteousness and cleanses. Last pause. There's another lady back here. Come on. Come on, sir. God's gonna help. Yeah, just come on. God's gonna help. Praise God. I need a lady to come and help me. Pray with her. If there's any others, maybe, maybe you're sitting next to somebody. God's, God's, God's dealing with someone. I encourage you, just give them a nut. Say, listen, listen, I'll pray with you. I'll go with you. I'll fight with you. I'll do what I can do. Hallelujah. Church, we're entering into unprecedented times. Let's not be dismayed. Let's not cower down. Let's not hunker down and get all our ammunition and just prep. No, uh, God's already seen this. He's not afraid. He's not afraid. He has saved you and I. Why? For such a time as this. It's time to rise up. It's time to move forward. That's the truth. I want us all to stand. I want us all to stand to our feet. We're going to open the altar. I want to encourage you to come. Find a place to, 
Talk to God. Just talk to God. God, what does that mean for me? Oh, Ramasha, Ramasha. Oh, Ramana, Mama. Oh, Ramashi, Kalaramasa. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God. We're nothing, God, without you. Oh, God, we know. We know, God. It's way bigger than us. Way bigger than us. Check, check. Eternal. Things are weighing in the balance. Souls are literally weighing in the balance. Oh, Ramama Shikala Sando. Oh, God, we love your name. Shikala Ramama. Oh, Ramama. Thank you, Jesus. God, I got to do the times now to do and be what God has called you to do and be. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we're not worthy. We count it an honor to represent the King, to be ambassadors. For the King of Kings, it's not, not anything to take light with us. Help us protect us from us.
you got to get to know him. Because I have no doubt in my mind that God will speak to you about things that are way beyond you. About things that cause you great fear, tumult, things that shake you to your core. And if God doesn't speak some of those things, you can be certain that he will. 